So welcome everybody to the innovation webinar, the healthcare industry perspectives. Hope everybody is safe and healthy during these challenging times. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Bhavesh Patel. I am Vice President of Global Marketing at ASCO Power Technologies, a Schneider Electric Company. I have been in uh, Schneider now since 1999, have uh, joined the business development and took on additional role and scope over the years, and currently in charge of global marketing. I've had opportunity to present at various conferences, publish articles, etc. So I continue to add to the body of industry knowledge. And today is another such event to continue building that body of education for any facility's electrical infrastructure. This particular event was recorded earlier, but we will have a live Q&A session as you're watching, so please start asking questions in the chat box. We also would like to get your feedback on the event or the content or future topics so we can continue to bring more value in the future. Today we have with us an industry expert, Yasid Gerbrowski, who's gonna share his knowledge about the industry and the electrical infrastructure within the healthcare uh, domain. So with that, I would like to introduce Yasek. Yasek, thank hey, you best. and welcome uh, to uh, the podcast. And please uh, introduce yourself and share a little bit about your background. Hey, Babesh, thank you very much. Um, as, uh, I'm actually a 1998 graduate from the University of Maryland. I have an electrical engineering degree. Um, I joined Leach Wallace Associates in 1999, got my PE license in 2003, I've been designing hospitals in the Mid-Atlantic region for, for the last 21 plus years. Um, you know, this includes new hospitals, outpatient facilities, clinics, uh, any types of renovations, additions, you know, major equipment replacements, um, emergency power systems, uh, whether it's the replacement or the upgrades. And uh, I'm also a very active member of IEEE in the, in the Baltimore chapter. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, great introduction, and thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to join us and share your thoughts today. So our conversation today will focus on four broad topics related to the healthcare industry's electrical infrastructure. They would be the COVID and its impact, sustainable technologies, the healthcare facility design strategies, and then digitization in healthcare. So with those four topics, let's start with COVID and the associated lockdown that happened and how that impacted the healthcare industry. So, so Yasit, obviously, you know, you probably have a lot better experience uh, handling the COVID and the associated mm -hmm. lockdown than I have. Uh, it resulted into huge short-term spikes in the need for hospital care or critical care. Yes. What were the learnings from that experience and the short-term spike? Yeah, I mean, that is very true. And the one thing about the healthcare industry, it is always changing and it is always evolving. And the coronavirus was just another way that it forced the system to evolve. Um, it was an, it, it's an infectious disease. And one of the major things that it, one of the major things that we learned from this is creating barriers. And whether that's having floors of hospitals or wings of hospitals or areas that could become infectious control uh, units, meaning that there were physical barriers between there. Uh, you had um, exhaust systems, special exhaust systems. And um, that was the, the major outcome of this, not to mention the upgrades in the HVAC systems that had to, had to take place. And with the HVAC system upgrades, uh, we had to do electrical upgrades to support the HVAC. Yeah, and, and I'm sure this thing is still playing out in the industry, and you're probably still trying to figure out what else or what different from uh, your normal. But so, so as, as we start to adopt this different, adopt this non-normal, how mm -hmm. much of that non-normal has become now the regular part of our everyday life in the healthcare industry? Well, the main thing that it's done is, is it's shifted the way that we design facilities. Even in the facilities that we're in design right now, in construction right now, we're issuing changes to adapt to 
being able to, for example, do 100% outside air on the air handling units. That's causing you know, systems to increase in size, electrical infrastructure to increase in size. That's going to be a normal. Uh, the, the barriers, uh, you know, a lot of times in the emergency departments, you had very large open spaces. You know, we're seeing a lot of that being broken down. Um, infectious control rooms, uh, we're seeing more of those being installed. And like I said before, you know, even entire areas just becoming devoted to infectious control patients where they can um, quarantine or, or contain them within a facility. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, again, there's a lot of change and, um, and and some of the change is good because it's uh, allowing us to continue to improve. Um, you know, I have personally heard about a lot of different strategies that were adopted by different parts of the country, different hospital groups um, to increase the capacity in, in a short notice. Mm-hmm. Anywhere from quick tents where you literally pitch a tent in a couple of hours yep. and run an extension cable and, and now you're in somewhat of a business to conversion of the convention facilities that have the the envelope environment, that have the, the air facility, the electrical facility. You, mm-hmm. you just need to bring in the beds and right. you need to bring in other critical care elements and now you have a quick expansion. Yeah. Uh, to even converting, say, a neonatal care or a maternity ward into COVID care on a short-term mm-hmm. basis. Which of this you think could we see more of in the future? Yeah, so I was actually involved in uh, a couple of projects that, with the, the Corps of Engineers. Uh, it ranged from full-service tents, as you mentioned, to conversions. And, um, you know, I think what we found is that in a lot of cases they were somewhat underutilized because they they were reactionary to the way we used to do things, meaning that there's a natural disaster, and what do you do? You set up large tents or convert spaces, and those are excellent triage areas, but they're not really good COVID spaces where you're dealing with air infectious diseases. So in a lot of cases where where these units got put up, Um, they were somewhat underutilized because there were no physical barriers that could be created in order to isolate whether it's the the most sick from from, um, not-so-sick patients. Um, What we found are the tents that were used for testing. Those are the tents that were utilized the best because it allowed people to remain in their cars, have a drive-through environment where it was somewhat conditioned, uh, protected from the weather, and you could test people, you know, without without actually having them go into the hospital. You know, the last thing you want is somebody who thinks they're COVID positive to go wait in line in a hospital to go get tested. So those are the those are the ones that we found um, that worked the best. Um, but infrastructure requirements, yeah, I mean that's big. You know, when it came to dealing with the core of engineers, they they understood infrastructure when it came to these portables. And oftentimes when they were um, setting up their portables, they would bring in their own generators. Um, But however, when we were doing these testing tents, those testing tents would rely on existing hospital infrastructure. And many times it was very easy for us to find power sources. However, a lot of times, you know, let's face it, these tents were set up, you know, outside kind of, you know, off to the side where maybe You know, it's not quite the front lobby. It's a little bit. And there wasn't always infrastructure available for those tents. So it it did um, it did cause us to do some hunting in order to find proper hookups for even these testing tents. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you had your work cut out for you when uh, you worked through this different scenarios of either tents or conversion of existing facilities to make sure that you strike the right balance. You know, the healthcare industry is all about compliance, right? But mm-hmm. it also is all about speed of care. Yes. Uh, because of the life uh, safety element associated. And and sometimes these two don't work in tandem. Mm-hmm. So h- how do you think that the healthcare industry struck that right balance, especially as it relates to that electrical infrastructure? I think you started to mention 
some elements of this, but I would like to have yeah. you go deep into that. Yeah, so I, I think I want to I want to highlight two projects that I worked on. Um, so you know, let's face it, getting permits on projects that's that's the biggest challenge. You know, from the time that we complete our drawings to the time that you can actually start the construction and have everybody on board, you have this permitting process. And you know, I don't know where our viewers are from, but depending on your area, the permitting process can be very challenging, and it can be a very prolonged process where you have to go through various levels of of getting, you know, building permits and and um, environmental permits and electrical permits and and all the various layers. So, you know, so. Uh, one of the one of the pro project types that I wanted to highlight are some of these temporary places that we did put up where we had to extend existing infrastructure. Because that was an extension of existing infrastructure, a permit was absolutely required, and we did have to produce permit drawings. But what we what we did is we had worked here with DCRA, Washington D.C. Um, they actually had a process that allowed the 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 function to be installed, and then we would actually go back at a later date and file for the permit. So you know, they were they were essentially trusting the professional engineers such as myself to produce a set of documents, direct the installation of the electrical facilities, and then have it permitted at a later date after the facility was actually up and running and performing the function that it needed to perform. So that was one example of a series of projects that we did for various, um, you know, various members of our society and hospital family, in order to get these emergency tents set up. Now, on the flip side, we had the emergency construction. In those cases, we actually worked directly with the authority having jurisdiction, and we had daily huddles. This was a, um, a fast-paced new construction project that needed to be built. It was a wing to a hospital that was essentially dedicated to COVID patients. It had specialized HVAC systems. It had specialized electrical systems. Um, it, was, it was barriered in such a way from the rest of the facility so that you had anti-rooms to allow the passage of clean and dirty materials, food, et cetera. And what this allowed us to do is working directly with the AHJ, we were actually producing drawings, and he was almost looking over our shoulder watching us produce the drawings to make sure that he was going to approve the overall system at the end. And what that allowed is it allowed a concurrent permitting and building process to come together. So it was not only design-build from a, from a standpoint of the engineer and the contractor, it was design-build with the standpoint of mm -hmm. the, the permitting and the AHJ working as part of the team in order to get the, this building approved. Wow! Wow! Yeah. So there's a there's a, a pretty thorough uh, review, even in this this kind of uh, lockdown environment. Yes. Which yep. which is which is nice. So so along those lines, as as you deployed and as you heard of others deploying these short term measures, whether it's stand, whether it's conversion of existing facilities. Because in the critical care space, backup power is an important requirement. Was backup power always part of this expansion provisions? Oh, absolutely. It was, okay. Yeah. So, you know, in, uh, in a lot of cases, you know, we had to study what the existing uh, backup power capacities were within these facilities. Um, and in many cases, there were, they were designed for expansion. So we were able to utilize existing infrastructure and extend that existing infrastructure uh, to to the expansions that were occurring. Okay, good, good. Now you know, I have seen myself uh, Hurricane Sandy to a certain extent, 9/11, Hurricanes Rita and Katrina, and the devastating impact those events had on broader economy and society at large. And those impacts resulted into changes in many areas, including regulation. So, for mm -hmm. example, 9-11 required that the cellular infrastructure give priority to the, the critical industries, whether it's police, whether it's utilities, whether it's whatever, sure. uh, over the normal mass 
consumption of uh, the voice and, and uh, now today data bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So that the the important channels of communication always remain engaged and open and, and, and effective. I'm sure this COVID-related lockdown is probably another milestone in our regulatory journey that is going to result into some sort of a change that becomes permanent part of our future. What kind of changes do you already see coming down the pike as it again relates to the healthcare electrical infrastructure? because of this lockdown. So, like I was saying before, I think it's going to impact the architects and the mechanical engineers the most. Um, you know, from a, you know, I think we've learned that this is very much a virus that needs to be contained. Um, and with that containment, you have the barriers. Um, obviously, you've got the, the first responders using PPE, but taking that to a bigger picture, you need to design facilities that do have the walls and the doors in the correct places where you can enclose those um, people. Uh, with the mechanical engineers, uh, you need to design the spaces that are ventilated properly, have uh, negative negative pressure in order to do the air changeover. Obviously, UV plays an important role. We've been using UV for years, but now it's um, it's becoming more and more important to utilize the UV. Um, both in within a space as, as an upper air UV and UV within the air handling systems. Well, where does this go? All of this needs power, and that that's where my role comes in. You know, we need to make sure that we have the proper power going to these HVAC systems, these UV systems. And whereas before, maybe we weren't worried so much about putting everything on backup power and generator. We're, we're seeing more and more of our systems being connected to the generator. Um, you know, it could be as much as 90% of a facility is now backed up on generator in order to maintain all of the uh, health systems, the, the HVAC uh, and everything else that's involved with it, in order to keep the people safe within the spaces that they're sitting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point that the digital world that we live in, that digital world cannot sustain any disruption of electrical flow. So that's right. Uh, it needs continuous supply of electricity. Now, a little bit associated with COVID, but a little different topic. Pre-lockdown, there was this, um, and more so in some pockets than others, but there was this general shift away from, say, large hospitals yeah. to these outpatient care and clinics. Yes. And in this lockdown, even those clinics had to shut down and shift to telemedicine. Mm -hmm. So coming back to that shift from large hospitals to the clinics, do we see that shift continuing or do we see a pause in the outpatient care clinic concept? Yeah. What do you see so far? So, you know, you're absolutely correct. You know, over the last, I would say, 10 years, we've definitely seen where – what they're trying to do is they're trying to get the people that don't necessarily belong in a hospital out of the hospital. They want to get them to an outpatient center or a clinic. And, you know, I do want to draw a delineation between an outpatient center and a clinic because, you know, from, from us and our perspective, we do design and take those slightly differently. So, you know, let's first talk about the outpatient center. Uh, when we see outpatient centers, you know, we see those as, you know, surgery centers, uh, places that you you might go, standalone emergency departments. Those those are what we truly see as an outpatient center. And yes, um, you know we are seeing a lot more of that type of construction going into play. And even within that, uh, as a result of this COVID, and um, we've been seeing what's going on is is that they're starting to incorporate what we like to call short stay, meaning that. You know, someone may be there from 24 to 48 hours. And this is a, a really good because what it does is it's good for observation and holding the patients um, until beds free up at the hospital, as an example. And it works out because these outpatient centers are typically located more, cent more, more in community environments, whereas hospitals may be further away from the community that they actually serve. Um, how has the outpatient center changed? Well, you know, we're starting to add more airborne infectious rooms or AII rooms and or even the entire short stay wing within that outpatient center 
may be converted to an airborne infection. And that doesn't mean that it's always airborne infection. It just means that you can switch it to an airborne infection, and then it becomes available should you have a group of patients come in that is showing the signs of infection. Um, the other thing that we're seeing with outpatient facilities is generator capacity. You know, it used to be that, you know, you would you know, you build an outpatient center, and you would put in, I hate to say this, but code minimum generator systems where you would essentially pick up your, your life safety, your critical, and maybe some, you know, HVAC for building preservations. We're not seeing that anymore either. You know, similar to a hospital, we're seeing these outpatient centers with relatively substantial generator systems that are capable of running 70, 80, 90 percent of the facility on generator power. It's almost business as usual. And, you know, that's where we're seeing that the outpatient center, they're still going to handle that, that, that patient that is maybe needs to go see a doctor. Maybe they're sick, maybe they're not sick with the COVID, but they're, they're able to go in there, possibly get tested, possibly get isolated, and wait for a bed to open up in the hospital should they need something more than that 24 to 48 hour treatment facility. Now, you also mentioned clinics. You know, when we look at a clinic, we're looking at a doctor's office. You know, you go and you see a doctor in an off-site clinic, or, you know, you've got the, uh, you know, the minute clinic that's in CVS as, an, as a quick example or, or something like that. Um, those are generally well patients. They're going in for their follow-ups. They might have a sniffle. You know, we're not, we're not talking about the sickest people going to a clinic. You know, the, you know, if you're, if you're truly ill, you're going to more of these standalone EDs, these outpatient centers that step down from a hospital facility that's located in your local community as opposed to perhaps a drive down the road to actually get to a hospital. Great, great. Again, thank you very much for sharing a lot of insights. Um, I want to remind our audience to start thinking about the questions they want to ask during the live sessions of YASIC. Uh, and uh, as you think about the questions, please put them in the chat. Okay, so then let's pivot to the next topic uh, today. Uh, let's speak a little bit about the healthcare design strategies. Mm -hmm. So Yasik, in the past, there was a little bit of a shift towards centralization of infrastructure, uh, especially when you have campus hospitals and multiple buildings in a campus. They didn't want each building to have things duplicated. So there would be a central location for all electrical things. So there would be a central HVAC plant. There would be a central whatever. Mm -hmm. And its management was also to some extent centralized. Now, the hospitals as a chain has grown. So sure. you don't have these individual hospitals. You have a lot bigger corporations that own multiple hospitals either mm -hmm. in a state or in a certain part of the country. And so that also allows some level of centralization. So the centralization might be either at the campus level or mm -hmm. in the geography to cater to the corporation that they're part of. Sure. Do you think that this this lockdown that we've experienced changes any of that? And, and if there is a change, why do you think there is a change? So, yes, I want to start out by saying we are definitely seeing that trend, um, especially in the area where I am. Uh, the, the Baltimore, Washington, D.C. area. Uh, we're definitely seeing a trend where uh, hospitals are essentially merging and becoming larger systems. And they're doing so so that they can share services, not only from the doctor, but also from the facilities management and, and, and all across the board, being able to, to share the data and being able to better have a geographical um, impression on the surrounding community. Um, but, you, you know, you mentioned how are we, how are these hospitals interconnecting? And I think one of the things that we've seen is, like, through the central monitoring of the overall facilities from one mo uh, central facility. And I think, you know, some of the earlier pioneers of this were the fire alarm systems. You know, I think fire alarm systems were some of the first ones that were, that were comfortable with broadcasting their signals back and forth and being able to centrally monitor at one location rather than having a monitoring location at each facility. And I think over the years we've seen that grow to now, you know, the building automation, the BAS system, the 
what controls all of the HVAC, the pumping, the chillers, the heating, et cetera. You know, a lot of smaller facilities will rely on some of the larger facilities in order to manage the BAS system for them. Um, but for whatever reason, from an electrical standpoint, um, you know, we've, been ha we've had power monitoring and data collection systems, metering, we've had that, those systems available to us for years. And while facilities are very comfortable sending that data and being able to look at that data at a remote facility, they're very reluctant to relinquish any control of those. So they're not quite comfortable with allowing the uh, person sitting at a remote facility to direct breakers to open and close. We have not, we have not seen that in our projects. They want to be able to see the electrical system. They want to know if a generator is running, if they want to know what the loading is on the main switch gear. They want to know if, uh, if, if one of the switch gear breakers tripped open. But they don't, they're not quite ready to allow that control to be remote. Um, Okay, yeah, so, so that's good that you, you start talking about what I call as command and control. Mm -hmm. and, and command and control is important, and it has a lot of layers. Yeah. There is a reliability layer. There is obviously a cost efficiency layer. Where do you think this command and control is coming into the healthcare industry from? And how is it helping kind of offset this, this restriction that you mentioned of allowing third-party access to data or allowing remote access to an, a system infrastructure? Yeah, so I think the main area that we're seeing a lot of command and control are in these outpatient facilities. Um, because of what an outpatient facility is, it is turning into something that is a technologically advanced building, yet it's not large enough and it, quite frankly, doesn't produce enough uh, revenue to warrant a full-time staff to, to monitor and maintain the building. So what we're seeing is, is a lot of cases, we've got the facilities managers in the hospitals who are also responsible for taking care of these outpatient, outpatient facilities. Um, when they're looking at these outpatient facilities, they want to be able to monitor the systems to the extent possible and be able to predict any type of failures that may be coming. So right now, like I was saying before, your fire alarm systems are shared, the IT systems are shared, the BAS systems are shared, and you're able to take a look at that. From the electrical side, what we need to do is we need to share the information coming off of the power monitoring and the metering systems so that you can track the health of breakers. You can uh, look at whether or not the the power flow is, is increasing in a way that could present a problem. You know, but the, the thing is, is that our industry right now, this is a data collection point only. Um, we don't have the ability to change states yet. Um, well, the, the, the hospital's not comfortable with giving the ability to change states, you know, mainly for the fear of hacking. But what it does do is it does allow facilities to monitor their systems and be able to deploy maintenance in a time efficient manner, not just to be there, but to go there to actually solve problems. Yeah, so you, you, you touched on something that I want to expand on a little bit. You mentioned the facility manager and you mentioned analytics. And, you know, the typical impression of a facility manager, at least say, definitely 20 years ago, is yeah. somebody that uh, is, is responsible for physical assets. Mm -hmm. And now through automation, through centralization, the, the physical asset are still there, but there's a lot more layer of complexity in that physical asset. There's a lot more digital capability within that physical asset. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more data generation and data analytics capability within that physical asset. So what now is the role of a facility manager in healthcare? And, and does it even start to blend into other roles? So there yes. is no longer the core facility manager of 20 years ago. The facility manager of today and more so in the future has to have seven layers of expertise compared to maybe one or two from a few years ago. What do you see happening for that particular function or role? Yeah, so let's talk about that for a minute because what you described is, is very true. You know, we're seeing a lot of the facility management being outsourced. 
And, mm -hmm. you know, not only is it the facility management that's being outsourced, but it's also the maintenance and the construction manager. You know, you mentioned, you know, 20 years ago, you know, even when I first started in this um, industry, uh, you'd walk into a hospital and you would see that the facility would employ three first-class engineers to operate their steam plant. They might have two or three master electricians, plumbers, HVAC techs all on staff. We even, we even knew some facilities that had a welder on staff. And most repairs and maintenance was performed in-house. Um, but now what's happening is, is through the outsourcing process, a lot of that is being handed over to contractors to perform a lot of these tasks. So what's left is you're left behind with staff that excels in the management of contractors and not necessarily the skills that the contractors perform. So it, what it does for me is it makes my job more difficult because a lot of that key knowledge that these guys had because they are the guys, the, the plumbers, the electricians, the HVAC techs, they're no longer mm -hmm. there. And whatever that intimate knowledge of the building that they had, well, that's just simply lost at this point in time. And what ends up happening is, is the standards in a facility may start to wander a little bit. You, you lose the continuity in projects. Uh, you know, things that may or may not be working don't necessarily get conveyed to us as the engineer. And it makes our job more difficult because now, you know, we need to better study how things are done within a building to make sure that the, the building is performing the way that the overall owner wants it to work. And we can't necessarily rely on the person that was always there for us within the facility, in the facilities management role. So essentially you're saying that because of the, the evolving role of the facility manager, in some cases maybe even a disappearing role of mm -hmm. the traditional facility manager, the healthcare design strategies are also changing. That's correct. And okay. what's what's happening is is it's, you know, we're using our best knowledge, but every facility is a little bit different. Every facility's owner is a little bit different. They have different ideas on how they want to do things. And we need that open line of communication to make sure that the client is getting what the client wants. Good, good. So again, I want to remind the audience to ask questions for the live Q&A session. Please uh, ask your questions through the chat feature. Now we want to shift to our third topic of the day, uh, which will focus on the sustainable technologies within the electrical infrastructure in the healthcare industry. So Yasik, you know, at, at least as far as I know, the renewables or solar, mm -hmm. they have not been typical or mainstream technologies within the healthcare industry. Again, not to say that they have not been there, sure. but they have not been mainstream either because of the reliability issues or because the healthcare industry comes from a compliance mindset and there were some gaps from a compliance standpoint. So so there was a, maybe a little bit of a, a lack of enthusiasm in adopting these technologies. Mm -hmm. Has anything changed in the recent past? Well, as it pertains to renewable solar, in general, the sustainable technologies in the healthcare industry? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think it has. And I think, I think we can go back and we can say that it probably started with LEED. You know, LEED goes back probably about 15, 16 years at this point in time. And, you know, many locales were incentivizing efficient buildings. And, you know, gaining the LEED points um, was well, something that was – prestigious and you wanted to hang that plaque on your wall. And one of the strategies toward getting that, that lead plaque on the wall was uh, utilizing green energy. And, you know, while lead gave hospitals sort of a pass by simply paying for credits, we actually yeah. did see uh, a number of, of um, facilities installing, for example, solar panels on their parking decks. You know, something that is somewhat remote where it doesn't necessarily affect the actual hospital building infrastructure. It was sort of in a standalone, but still somewhat connected to the facility. Uh, we've also seen um, a lot of interest in solar panels um, being installed on hospital roofs. Um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, we haven't necessarily seen a lot of them installed, but it doesn't, but it, at least they're thinking about it. Um, other green energies 
such as wind. Uh, no, we, we haven't seen that, um, but it is something that, that could be utilized at some point in the future, especially for, you know, small power, uh, power sources. Yeah, and, and so along those lines, you know, you mentioned solar and uh, uh, wind. And we had recently done a, a study of a lot of facility uh, executives related to microgrids. Mm-hmm. And quite honestly, it was surprising just to understand the lack of knowledge within the industry about what is a microgrid. Sure. Uh, but But putting that aside for a minute, as we interviewed a lot of people, we also interviewed people from Kaiser Permanente, the large hospital chain based out of the West Coast. And uh, an executive from Kaiser explained microgrid as a system that generates energy, mm-hmm. stores it, and distributes mm-hmm. when required. And so we were a little uh, surprised to hear the word storage right. of energy uh, described by Kaiser as it pertains to microgrid, is mm-hmm. the storage becoming part of, or energy storage rather, becoming part of the healthcare electrical infrastructure? Well, first, let's say that microgrid can be defined in several different ways, yeah, and, exactly. and, and, and we'll get back to that. But let's discuss storage. Um, you know, it sounds to me like you're accepting the word storage as batteries, and, you know, Storage can mean a lot or can be defined in many different ways. And I would argue with you that hospitals have been storing energy for years. It just, it was in the terms of diesel fuel. And um, the purpose of the storage was to supplement the facility in the event of a failure. And can you replace diesel fuel with storage batteries? And I would say the answer is absolutely. Yes, you can. But there are advantages and disadvantages to both. You know, one advantage, one, one might say, well, diesel fuel needs to be maintained. You know, you need to turn it over to make sure that it doesn't start growing uh, algae and things of that sort. You know, it, it does have an expiration to it. Uh, well, you know, I'll argue with you that with the storage batteries, I, I definitely see them as, as an evolving technology, something that can be and should be used in, in facilities, um, but the problem with a storage battery is, let's say you have a prolonged outage. Well, you can have a contract with a company to come refill your diesel tank. You can't really refill a battery very well. So while I think they're fantastic for short-term gaps, whether it's two days or three days, once you get to an outage that might last a week or two weeks, you're going to be in trouble if your only backup power is a storage battery. Now, like I said before, I think storage batteries should be used in conjunction with a system where you uh, combine many different types of uh, storage systems where batteries and diesels can work together, maybe so that you don't have to store as much diesel on site as you would normally. So, and that, that's a great point, that uh, storage is beyond battery. Yes, I was implying batteries, but you clarified and uh, thank that you did that because it is beyond batteries, and you're right that storage could be in the form of just diesel fuel. So talking about diesel fuel, mm-hmm. you know, hospitals, for example, always have had this 10-second rule for backup power, that the yes. backup power has to be up and running within 10 seconds, at least for the life uh, safety um requirements. Sure. And traditionally, that was possible using diesel as a generating technology. But now, because again, from sustainability reasons or, or whatever mm-hmm. other reasons, natural gas technology is starting to become a little more acceptable. Yes. And, and yes, natural gas has, has pros and cons, mm-hmm. uh, but in some cases, maybe the 10-second rule is not something that the natural gas always can guarantee. So do you see natural gas becoming more of the mix of generating technologies? And and if so, what do you think is driving that? Yeah, so I absolutely agree with you that, uh, you know, for years and years and years, we've been relying on diesel. In fact, you know, anytime anyone, including me, would suggest, oh, 
maybe we should use something else besides just diesels to, in order to power this facility, there was always pushback. You know, diesels are reliable. We've always used diesels. Diesels can 100% step load. Diesels are guaranteed to be up in 10 seconds. You know, there's a lot of these, these, these things that people use as an excuse to not even talk about other technologies. And like you mentioned, natural gas has been around for a long time. Um, a, a rich burn natural gas engine, uh, properly tuned, can easily start up within 10 seconds and accept load um, that the same way that a diesel can. Uh, the, the issue that you're going to run into is your authority having jurisdiction. You know, a lot of times they're reluctant to approve an emergency generator that is being used in a hospital that relies on a municipal source such as natural gas. Uh, we've definitely seen some propane units going in, um, but the, having relying on the natural gas system, we've had some pushbacks. Now, we've definitely seen these types of natural gas, uh, small natural gas engines going in when it comes to an office building, a parking garage, a school. You know, those are those are excellent places where you can utilize a natural gas unit. Uh, the issue once you get into the hospital world is that these natural gas engines would have to get quite large. You know, from a from a physical size standpoint, they're much larger than a diesel engine. And then, of course, because it's more iron, because there's more engineering involved with it, you know, the natural gas engine is significantly more expensive. So while we do do our best to present uh, natural gas as viable alternatives where we see that it's fit, um, we do get some pushback from owners from you know, increased size and increased costs. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't utilize it in other ways. Uh, you know, we've had several projects where we actually mix diesel and natural gas engines on, in the same facility and, and parallel them together. And that's been very successful for us because then you get the benefits of both engines with reduced uh, on-site diesel requirements as well as the reduced emissions from a natural gas engine. Yeah, great, great. Thank you. Thank you again. So, again, I want to uh, remind people of uh, the option to ask questions of Yasek for the live section of this event. So, please uh, start putting your questions in the chat box. We're now going to move to our fourth topic of the day, which is digitization in healthcare. Okay, Yasek, so you, you spoke a little bit about the predictive uh, uh, intelligence that, that comes as a result of all the equipment used in the healthcare industry that has data collection and data mining capability, and that could also lead into artificial intelligence. Yes. Uh, do you think that predictive maintenance could become part of the healthcare industry's reality? Because I feel like they come from this mindset where they have to physically, a human being has to physically double check everything. If I'm sick and I go to the doctor, I can take all my measuring devices they will read that, they will view that information, but they'll still get me tested from blood standpoint or physically do my uh, bios or, or, or whatever they need to do to for them to personally confirm mm -hmm. what they need to conclude before they start my treatment plan. So sure. do you think that the predictive maintenance, because that's a little different from the, the mindset of healthcare industry, do you think that becomes part of the reality in the healthcare industry? Yeah, I, and I'm glad you brought that up because, let's face it, healthcare costs are rising and everybody's looking on how to trim costs. So you said that uh, you go in for a checkup and you get your blood work taken care of, you get your blood pressure checked, uh, your temperature checked, things of that sort. Well, what if we did that on a continuous basis? What if we were always measuring your blood pressure? What if we were always measuring your temperature? We could follow a trend and not let you get to the point where you're actually running a fever. Let's look at that from equipment as well. You know, let's go ahead and let's install the necessary sensors. Let's collect the data off of the computers that are already part of every piece of infrastructure. We can then better predict the mean time before failure. I know that's a buzzword, but you know, building owners who understand the importance of this, they're willing to spend a little bit extra money in order to have all of these sensors properly installed, have the data properly collected, and then really what it comes down to is you need a good integrator. And that was one of the things that we've been seeing a lot of, is we've been seeing a lot of building integration systems coming into play 
where it is taking data from here and from there and combining it to form these matrices where it looks like something is happening. And as a result, you know, someone who then understands the system can put together a cause and effect. When you see these things happening, you need to do this. And that might be when you alert the proper staff, the proper maintenance personnel to go and take a look at that piece of equipment because you're seeing something that is going to lead to a failure. In, in many ways, that's going to save money because, you know, we don't know if a piece of equipment is being over-maintained or under-maintained. We just know that it's operating. You know, if a piece of equipment can operate for several months or several years between preventive maintenance, well, that's time that that maintenance guy can devote to something else. And overall, it will, it will save the facility money. And that's where I think this is going, is if we can uh, shift our maintenance to where it needs to be, as opposed to, oh, it's been one year, we need to do this, then I think um, you're, going, you're going to see true savings in the healthcare industry. Thank you. Thank you, Yasek. A uh, lot of engaging uh, topics that you spoke about, and um, I lost a little track of time. Uh, I do want to leave some time aside for the audience to ask questions live. So we'll end the recorded version here. Uh, again, audience, if you have not done so yet, please start asking your questions to the chat box. Hello, everybody. We are now live again. I'm Bhavesh Patel, Vice President of Global Marketing at ASCO Power Technologies. And with me live is Yasik Grabowski, Senior Engineer at Leach Wallace Associates. Yasik, thank you very much for spending some time with me earlier to record our conversations and sharing your thoughts and insights related to the electrical infrastructure within healthcare industry. It seems we have lots of questions from our live audience today which, by the way, was over 500 registrations this morning. So a lot of people uh, have joined us and uh, had uh, listened to our conversations. And it seems like there's a lot of interest in today's event. So uh, let's go to the Q&A. Uh, the first question is related to the comments you made, Yasek, during our chat about the need to upgrade the HVAC system as well as the need to have UV sterilization as a means to keep the hospitals clean. And the question is, uh, is there a general feel for the percentage increase in electrical service size required to support those upgraded HVAC and UV sterilization capabilities? Yes, yeah, so I was thinking about this and, and yeah, so when a, when a building load is put together that it is made up of the, the actual envelope load or the HVAC load, and then there's also the load that is within the building, the occupant load, and, you know, and the equipment load. So I think what we're seeing, and I was thinking about a couple of projects recently, we're seeing probably a 10 to 20 percent increase on the HVAC portion of the electrical systems. So, you know, because every building is different, it's hard to say that the service size is going to increase by a percentage, but what we're seeing is, is the HVAC is increasing by about 20%. Okay, okay, great. Does that apply across all types of hospitals or is it related to a certain size of a hospital? I think it's more dependent on the number of systems that are being upgraded to, to this um, increased air supply exhaust environment. Um, because with the you know increase in outdoor air, you're going to increase your your chiller size and things of that sort. But hospitals are not made up of one air handling unit. They're going to have multiple air handling units throughout the facility, and you may not necessarily uh, do increased air supply on all of them. You may choose certain ones to be an increased uh, outdoor air supply. Okay. And, and there is a related question, so uh, let's uh, address that now as well. So the question is that, again, we speak about the, the need to improve and increase the air supply, but what about exhaust? So mm -hmm. before exhausting air from the hospital, does that need to be treated, or what measures are required to prevent airborne 
uh, diseases from re-entering into the air supply system of a hospital? Yeah, and that's an excellent question because there are two very different schools of thought here. And um, the first school of thought is the, I'll call it the traditional laboratory exhaust system or the high blast fans where, and, and people have seen these on roofs before, it's the column of air that is uh, going up and out. And essentially what you're doing is you're introducing atmospheric air, mixing it with the exhaust and blasting it up into the atmosphere at a high velocity. And the thought is, well, we're gonna disperse it to a point where it no longer can affect people. And the idea is, is that these are located in areas that are uh, away from the air intakes of the incoming systems. But again, it, it is assuming that we are dispersing the airborne infectious disease to a point where it's no longer infectious. The other school of thought is um, HEPA filtration on the, on the roof. And we've definitely seen an interest in these where the HEPA filters are installed and you're essentially treating the exhaust before you're exhausting it. The issue with that is, is the HEPA filters do have a life, they do need to be changed. Well, at that point in time, you're dealing with infectious waste and the person who's doing that work needs to be properly dressed and go to perform the work of replacing that filter. Also, you turn into the problem where if you're servicing the one filter, then that means that the air is not being treated. So what do you do? Do you introduce two filter banks? And yes, we have seen that in modern design where you actually have two parallel filter banks that are HEPA filtered where you can turn one off, replace the filter, turn it back on, and then reverse it on the other side. That way you never actually lose the treated exhaust system from your occupied space. So those are the two schools of thought that we're seeing right now. Uh, the, most com or the, the most common one um, before COVID was the high, high blast fans. Um, we are definitely seeing our newer projects. They are shifting to the HEPA. Um, but again, I think it introduces other things that the owner now needs to deal with, and that is the basically the infectious filters. Okay, okay. Uh, the next question seems like a little bit of a clarification. I think you mentioned something about outpatient, and the question says that I thought outpatient centers are limited to 24-hour stays. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you implied that the outpatient facility need somebody staying more than 24 hours, but uh, so, you want to yeah, so I, yeah, I do want to clarify that because, yes, you know, what we call an outpatient center is traditionally limited to 24-hour stays, but what we're seeing is, is that they are creating these short-stay units within the outpatient center. These short-stay units are actually I-2 regulated, um, and as a, as a result of that, they've got the improved fire protection, fireproofing, and they are upgrading those to 48 hour stays or short stay 48 hours. That's the latest trend that we're seeing. Uh, it is something that is new. Uh, so that is, um, you know, the, the listener was correct that in general, um, outpatient centers are 24. This, this is something that we're seeing a new evolvement to where they're creating these short stay units within these um, uh, 24 hour outpatient centers to be 48 hours. There are other things that you need to take into account. Uh, for example, at this point in time, you're gonna need to have food facilities, some type of kitchen, warming kitchen, um, in order to be able to feed these patients who are now gonna be here for 48 hours. Okay, okay, yeah, thanks for that clarification. Uh, the next question is about the fuels. Again, uh, you touched on uh, the diesel versus natural gas. And this question talks about dual fuel generators where natural gas and propane are the two fuel sources. And mm -hmm. the question is, if those two propane, uh, propane and natural gas sources were specified, would that be acceptable alternative to diesel for life safety Article 700 applications? For Article 700, absolutely. There is, there's no doubt that for an Article 700 um, emergency application, you can definitely get away with a, a propane natural gas system because really what it comes down to is the, the actual emergency 
Article 700 runtime for an engine for proper building, safe proper building evacuation is only a couple of hours. So you can definitely have a couple of hours of propane storage and then rely on the natural gas system. That is a, a perfectly code compliant system. Okay. So how does that system, because I know the 10 second rule also falls in that same bucket. Uh -huh. How does the 10 second rule also meet the dual fuel gas and propane combination? As long as the engine is a rich burn uh, engine that has the capabilities of starting and picking up load within 10 seconds, it is acceptable under Article 700. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully, uh, we have time for a couple more questions. So the next question is more related to combined heat and power. Mm -hmm. um, and the question um, is a little more a comment, but maybe there is a question somewhere in between. Um, it reads that the combined heat and power is used. The choice of fuel is mostly natural gas. And as such, it offers expanded on-site power availability during utility service outages, similar to what you just alluded to. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm looking at this question. It came from, from Mr. James Daly, and he actually has its, uh, it, it's, his, he put it in, in in multiple parts. And I did want to address it because it is something that it, that we're doing right now, and uh, I think it's, it's definitely worth the conversation. So, yeah, so a CHP engine historically is a, a lean burn natural gas engine. And as a result, it has a very limited step load. It is not a 10 second engine. Um, the, the step loads on a, on a lean burn CHP are typically somewhere in the neighborhood of 5% to, to 10%, maybe 15%. So it, it, is, it is a very slowly loaded engine, but that doesn't mean it can't be utilized. And we are utilizing it. So the way that we're utilizing it is in, in two ways. Number one, we're utilizing it as a as a way of peak shaving or slowing the meter down or or whatever buzzword you want to use. And uh, that's when it's running in parallel with the utility. We're also taking that same engine and we're paralleling it with the diesels on our emergency power side. And what that does is it allows us to quickly start the diesels, pick up our most critical loads within the 10 seconds, have the on-site storage as required by NFPA 99. But then what we do is we bring on the CHP and we parallel the CHP with the diesels. We then base load the CHP and we continue to run the CHP in parallel with the diesels where the CHP is base loaded and the diesels take the bumps as chillers, air handling units, x-ray equipment, elevators. While that equipment is um, running and uh, the CHP can just sit there base loaded. What does what does that do? It saves on diesel. It prolongs our our runtime on the diesels. Uh, we can we can lower the load. You may if you have a multiple diesel setup, you may even be able to shut one of the diesels down. Um, hospitals are excellent um, uses for a CHP. They have a constant heat load. The boilers run year round. CHP in a hospital is a very good application if you can make the financials work. Okay, great, great. Um, seems like we have a lot of questions uh, still in the queue. Maybe we have time for one more. Um, everybody today will receive uh, a PDH certificate, and you will also get an email with a link to take the quiz for the CEU certificate. Yeah, I think one more question. Yes. The, there is a shortage of electrical engineers. Mm -hmm. And you also discussed the reduced or changing role of the facility managers in healthcare. When you combine the two, there is a talent issue. How is the healthcare industry dealing with this talent issue? Yeah, um, it is challenging because, you know, most electrical engineers graduating from college just really aren't interested in doing this line of work. Uh, you know, this is partly due to the fact that colleges don't necessarily expose our young engineers to the consulting industry. But part of that is that the consulting industry is just not as glamorous as some might view a job at Google or Facebook. Uh, facilities managers at the same time are, you know, they're being overtasked with running multiple facilities and relying on engineers as myself to provide guidance to problems. 
So while an engineer continues to design new projects, they're also supporting the facilities managers and continue to, to continue that relationship to win future projects. So, you know, what's the, you know, what's the solution? You know, it's tough, but I think what we need to do is we need to continue to encourage people to enter the engineering field and to be sure that engineers in college understand what it is that we do and how rewarding it can be. You know, I attend job fairs at college and, you know, people always come up and say, well, what is a consulting engineer? What is it that you do? You know, and I'm literally looking for people that are interested in expanding their horizons. You know, I can, I always look across the gymnasium and I can see, you know, the, the Amazon or the Google booth and you know, there's always a gaggle of people hanging out over there, but it, it's, um, it always, it, I always question, well, what do you get working for Google? You know, you work for a consulting engineer. You can build buildings and hospitals and bridges and, and all these great things that are going to be around literally for generations. And um, it, it is rewarding, and I think we do need to work with being able to pass that knowledge base on and encourage and excite our young people to, to come into this industry. Great, great. Thank you very much, Yasik, for, again, spending the time uh, with us, sharing your thoughts and your insights. Uh, thank you very much, audience, for uh, the active participation and a long list of questions. Obviously, we could not get to every one of those questions, but we will respond to them. Thank you for attending today's session and look forward to seeing you on a future session from ASCO Power Technologies. Goodbye.